crazy and I have no idea like how to handle it. And... <laughs> Now, students at Umpqua Community College in tears right now after a shooting left 13 people dead and 20 others injured. We learned late this afternoon the shooter died after a gun battle with police officers. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bob Donaldson. I'm Debbie Knox, and we are continuing to learn more information about what happened at the Oregon school. Shannon Hauser has been checking the latest in our newsroom. She's joining us now with the latest. Bob and Debbie, some really chilling details that we are getting now. We have just learn from students in those classrooms where the student shooting began. One student says the gunman shot a teacher and then asked others in the classroom about their religion. She says he told students to stand up, state their beliefs before he started spraying bullets. The student says the gunman shot through a window and then told those in the room to get on the ground. We've learned in the latest press conference the gunman died in a shootout with police. The sheriff in Douglas County saying the the gunman fired at police and then shots were exchanged. Law enforcement confirming 13 people dead as well as 20 plus hurt. Hospitals in the surrounding communities continue to treat patients. We've learned two of them died while being transported to a hospital. It's believed the shooting started in one of the science classrooms. Sources confirming the victims were found in at least two classrooms over there on the college campus right now. Officials are saying their top priority is just treating the students and making sure that there was a safe location. They said it's very difficult in the minutes after the shooting. They're still working to inform those families and loved ones about those injured and killed. All right, Shannon, thank you very much. Currently, we've got um, we've got more of the compound to do a thorough search of. We have to process um, the scene or scenes where the shooting occurred. Um, we have a parking lot full of vehicles out there that we have to process and, and search. Um, and obviously, we have just a, a ton of interviews to conduct. Now the shooting happened in a very remote location in that small town. Very difficult for people to find out information. They're working mm -hmm. with families to try to help them inform them of those victims. Now, uh, also that that campus is a pretty small campus. Quite a few students are full time as well as part time. Still trying to get information there on what the age range of those yeah, students injured and killed tonight, are. That's for sure. All right, Shannon. All right, thank Shannon. you very much. This is a developing story, mm -hmm. so let's take a minute to recap. Today's shooting at Umpqua Community College in Oregon left at least 13 people dead and 20 injured. The campus is located in Roseburg, that's just south of Portland. Now, the shooter is a man in his 20s. He was killed at the scene. He was involved in a gun battle, as we reported, with police responding to 911 calls from the campus. The motive for the shooting is unknown. We're getting more information on that part of the story. We'll continue to post the latest to CBS4Indy.com throughout the day, and we'll update you throughout this newscast as we learn more. And Bloomington police are investigating an apparent murder-suicide. Police say that a man killed a woman, then himself, at an apartment complex for students just south of College Mall. The two bodies were found in a common area of the Stratum Apartments. Bloomington police say the 21-year-old woman was stabbed to death. They believe the man then committed suicide by hanging himself. Officials with IU confirm the woman was a junior. The 20-year-old man did not attend the university. It's terrifying, especially that it happened right here at my my complex and you know this is my first time being away from home and being in a big city like this being so far away you know that's really um, it's unsettling to know that this can happen it really does happen so far police have not released the names of the victim or the suspect 101 people murdered in Indianapolis so far this year. Many of those recent incidents have been concentrated in one area. Take a look at this map. It shows the north and the near north side. As you can see, police have investigated seven homicides there since mid-August, including the most recent killing of a 10-year-old boy. CBS 4's Liz Gillardi shows us what's behind this recent spike in violence. We are hearing a lot of concern from people in this area. They're trying to turn it around, but they're frustrated by the recent killings, including a 10 year old boy, an innocent victim caught in the crossfire of a drive by shooting. Police are dedicating extra resources in this area and continuing to investigate those recent killings. A few blocks, few incidences only take one or two to start a, a, 
uh, a series of events and what we're trying to do is stave it off. Clay Thomas and Kyle Jordan saw it happening all around them. They moved into a home on Graceland at the end of July. Weeks later, shots fired at the end of their driveway. Then a 10 year old boy killed in a drive by shooting across the street. Uh, when we had the had the incident across the street with uh, the, the 10 year old being shot. It was just a little bit too much for us. Concern for their safety. They're moving out. The violence picked up in late August. Police are trying to determine if any incidents could be connected. The Butler Tarkington Neighborhood Association is talking with IMPD and meeting with residents. It's cause for concern and we really need to have a focus on community policing. Uh, residents looking out for their fellow neighbors and really to say enough is enough and that we don't tolerate that activity in this neighborhood, uh, such as illegal drugs or illegal weapons. Just last night, North District officers worked with state police to patrol the area. They happened to be in the very neighborhood where detectives investigated a homicide earlier in the day. Chief Rick Height says drug dealing and other disputes are contributing to the recent violence. There are connections, as we stated, with families, friends, and people knowing each other for years, and we're seeing that in the data. As we say, we pick these areas based on the data, it's data driven and focus areas and particularly those areas that are on our radar screen for violence. And this is an example of what we're saying. IMPD's North District is continuing to dedicate extra resources to this area whenever possible, in some cases using overtime. They're also doing targeted sweeps to get more information on these recent shootings and get guns off the streets. Liz Gilardi, CBS 4 News. Liz, thank you. An update now to another recent homicide in the city. A woman has been arrested for a shooting on the east side. On Tuesday, Will Allen Smith was shot and killed on Llewellyn Drive, just blocks from 38th and Midhoffer. Today, police arrested 55-year-old Kathy Lyles on a preliminary charge of murder. Details about what led to her arrest have not yet been released. And Greenwood police have arrested this man, Kendall Rio Cruz Trujillo for shooting a man outside the Four Seasons family restaurant yesterday morning. The victim, Miguel Hernandez, worked at that restaurant. Greenwood police say it was part of a domestic dispute. Well, before we get to our local weather forecast, we want to show you the severe weather approaching the East Coast. Hurricane Joaquin is a Category 4 storm now. It's already moved through the Bahamas and may now begin to affect the southeastern part of the U.S. Today, Governor Chris Christie declared a state of emergency for New Jersey. We know that there is definitely going to be moderate and likely to be major flooding events. We could see some of that flooding as early as tomorrow. So let's bring in Chief Meteorologist Chris Wright on this story. Now the technology, Chris, has improved, but yes. it's still unclear exactly which track this hurricane is going to take, correct? Yeah, right now the storm is moving southwest, so it's actually moving toward Cuba right now, but we expect that storm to take a turn northward over the weekend, and that's why Governor Christie's has declared that state of emergency. When do you think we'll have a better idea of exactly when it's going to be making landfall Probably and where? Probably really won't know until Saturday. Right now it's still drifting off to the southeast. Once it makes that turn to the north, that'll give us a better idea of where it's going to go. And the storm is getting stronger as it's now moving to the southwest at six miles per hour. Top winds are at 130 miles per hour, now moving through the central Bahamas toward Cuba. But once it makes that north return, it will begin to affect the U.S. coast. Meanwhile, here at home, we've got a mix of clouds and sunshine today. Have had a couple of scattered showers going on down across southeast Indiana, and we'll see that rainfall area spreading. We've got the hurricane down across the Bahamas and a strong area of low pressure down over the southeast. Those two systems will join together to spread some rainfall our way coming up over over the course of the weekend. Right now we've got temperatures in the 60s across central Indiana, so we're going to have a nice cool night of weather before that rainfall moves in. I'll show you how that rain may affect your weekend plans coming up and your weather authority forecast. All right, Chris, we'll talk to you then. New at six tonight, a Hamilton County mother is taking action to increase awareness about Indiana's statewide drug problem. Yeah, she is heading to Washington, D.C. tomorrow where she wants her voice to be heard. CBS 4's Kendall Downing is here with that story. Kendall. Yeah, hi, Bob and Debbie. Gina Bardock started a support group in October of last year to offer an open community to addicts and families dealing with addiction in Hamilton County and beyond. She says state and national leaders must do more now that Indiana's drug problem is a crisis. We're in bad, bad shape, and it could take years to see any kind of resolution. The pain of addiction hits home for Gina Bardock. The Fisher's mother started hope and overcoming after seeing her son Brandon struggle with addiction to prescription pills and heroin. He's 30 months clean now, but this mom is still fighting for her son and others. What we need is emergency funding 
emergency help from state and federal government. Bardock leaves Friday bound for the nation's capital. Sunday, she will attend a star-studded rally called Unite to Face Addiction. Then Monday, she takes her message to Capitol Hill. I'm going to represent not just District 5, but all of Indiana and meet with Congresswoman Susan Brooks and, and staff of Joe Donnelly, staff of Dan Coates. What I tell them is that Indiana is suffering more and more every day. She says it's a start that the governor has a task force looking into drug issues. Most crucial, she says, is getting more treatment options in Indiana. And I'm going to tell you, every intervention that Hope and Overcoming has done and put people into treatment, they've gone out of state. Kylie Williams watched her brother Robbie struggle with addiction, a fight the drugs won. Earlier this year, um, my brother actually fatally overdosed and... Um, I found him when I was on my way to classes at IEPY. Now she talks to high schoolers in Hamilton County to offer a real perspective of the dangers. We have to get through to people because no one knows that it's actually here. It is the definition of like desperate housewives. Just sweep it under the rug. No one's going to know. So today, U.S. Senator Joe Donnelly sent a letter to the co-chairs of Governor Pence's task force with suggestions like expanding access to drug courts. Donnelly noted that the state must make a commitment to implementing and funding any programs. And by the way, guys, the next meeting for that task force is coming up October 15th in Evansville. We've done so many stories about this. It is clear the conversation yeah. about this has to continue. Just talking about the needle exchange programs and all the things going on with that. That's yeah. right. A lot of talk at the state level and federal, too. Right. Kendall, thank you. You bet. Well, there is a new way to help out a great cause here in central Indiana. It's called Shifting Gears, and to no surprise, it involves bicycles. We explain how prisoners are working to get your donation to help out the community. Weapons as part of a Halloween costume, the warning IMPD has for both parents and teens. And it's Blue Friday tomorrow, but pink will be the color downtown. We'll be live with the Colts tomorrow morning before they turn the canal pink for breast cancer awareness this month. Join Tim, Marianne, Nicole, and Lindsay for CBS 4 this morning from 5 to 7 in the morning. And remember, we've got Thursday night football right here on CBS tonight. It's the Baltimore Ravens at the Pittsburgh Steelers. Our coverage starts at 7.30. The game starts at 8.30. Don't miss it.